Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. This video is the next in a series looking at the financial implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the global economy. And in today's episode, I want to talk about natural gas. It's just been announced that Russia has cut off the supply of gas to the Netherlands and Denmark and has also stopped supplying Shell in Germany. So in this video, I'll have a look at how important those gas supplies are to the Netherlands and Denmark. We'll talk about what's going on with regards to the rest of Europe and how much dependency still exists from all of the countries that are still buying from Russia. And we'll talk about the options that all of the different countries have in terms of where else they could source natural gas from. We'll then talk about prices and what the likely implication of all of these actions are on both gas prices and the global economy. So before we get started on all of that, as usual, if I could ask you for a thumbs up at some point during this video, and also please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Don't forget I include chapters in these videos so you can skip over things if you're not that interested in them. And if you'd like to support the channel, please have a look in the description below where you'll find links to Buy Me A Coffee, Patreon, and YouTube Super Thanks feature. On the 31st of March, President Putin announced that all unfriendly nations had to make all of their future payments for natural gas in rubles. And if they didn't, then they would be switched off in terms of their natural gas supplies. And this was quite a big threat because a lot of countries in Europe use that natural gas to create electricity. And a lot of countries also supply gas directly to households to use for cooking and heating. So it's a really important part of the infrastructure. At the time that President Putin made this demand, nobody was really quite sure whether or not he was bluffing. But as it turns out, he obviously wasn't bluffing because over the last few weeks, we've started to see the supplies being switched off to various countries. So the first two countries that were completely cut off were Poland and Bulgaria. And both of them came out and made categorical statements that they would not be paying in rubles. None of the countries of Europe actually have any rubles. All of the rubles are sitting with the Russian banks. So in order to facilitate this new payment process, Russia offered the option of all countries paying in dollars or euros as per the terms of the agreed contract and then instructing the Russian banks to convert that currency into rubles in order to make the payment to Gazprom. So formal agreement was needed from each country in order to keep its supplies coming. And this was partly a power play by Russia because they wanted to show that they could force all of the countries of Europe to do what they wanted, but also it was a way of upholding the value of the ruble because converting large amounts of dollars and euros into rubles was keeping demand for rubles high. And that's why we've seen a rapid recovery in the value of the ruble over the last month or two. So Poland and Bulgaria were the first two countries to be cut off and Finland was the third. And we've now seen the fourth and fifth countries being the Netherlands and Denmark. And we've also seen Shell supplies in Germany, which it was using to sell on into the German markets, also being cut. So we now know that President Putin wasn't bluffing, that if you don't pay in rubles, then you won't carry on being supplied. And all of those countries in Europe who need to keep the supplies flowing know exactly what they need to do. The Netherlands has a population of around 17 million people and is situated in northern Europe on the North Sea and it borders onto both Germany and Belgium and because of its coastal location and deep ports it's operated historically as a gateway for shipping traffic for the rest of Europe. Now the Netherlands does have a high dependency on natural gas. Around 40% of all of the electricity produced in the country comes from gas-fired power stations and gas is also supplied to around 90% of all of the households in the Netherlands for cooking and heating purposes. However, the country does have its own supplies of natural gas. The Netherlands has gas and oil fields in the North Sea, and because of its coastal location, it's also very well located to be able to import liquefied natural gas on tankers. Geographically, it's also situated further away from Russia than a lot of the other countries in Europe who take the natural gas supplies. As a result of this, the dependency on Russian gas historically has been around 11%, so not a massive amount of the market. Gas purchases in the Netherlands are made by Gas Terror, which operates on behalf of the Dutch government. And following President Putin's announcement that all future payments had to be made in rubles, Gas Terror announced 
that it would not go along with Gazprom's payment demands because to do so would risk breaching sanctions imposed by the EU and also because there are too many financial and operational risks associated with the required payment route. Gazterra has repeatedly urged Gazprom to respect the contracted agreed payment structure and supply obligations, but to no avail. So from this statement, we can see that the Netherlands wanted to continue taking gas from Russia. However, it refused to bend to President Putin's demand to pay in rubles. And as a result of that, the relationship has now broken forever. Now, fundamentally, this is not going to be a problem for the Netherlands. They actually have large storage facilities, so they can build up large gas supplies. And because they're getting 90% of the gas from other sources, it really isn't going to be a major issue throughout the summer period. And they've got the opportunity now to build up their storage to make sure that going into the winter of 2022, they won't have any issues. Denmark has a population of around 6 million people and is also situated in Northern Europe. The majority of Denmark's landmass is situated on a peninsula referred to as Jutland, which borders directly onto Germany. And the country also has over 400 individual islands. Orsted is the company in Denmark that buys gas and is majority owned by the Danish state. Alongside the Netherlands, Orsted also refused to agree to Russia's demand to pay in rubles. A company statement said Gazprom Export continues to demand that Orsted pays for gas supplies in rubles. We have no legal obligation under the contract to do so, and we have repeatedly informed Gazprom Export that we will not do so. There is a risk that Gazprom Export will stop supplying gas to Orsted. In Orsted's view, this will be a breach of contract. So as per the contract, Orsted continued to make its payments in euros, and it's now been announced that Gazprom have cut off all supplies to Denmark. Now, in terms of what the impact of this will be on Denmark, it's going to be relatively limited. In 2021, Orsted purchased around 155 billion cubic meters of natural gas from Russia, which equated to roughly 1.5% of Russia's total exports to Europe. And there are a few reasons why Denmark is not hugely exposed to Russian gas. Firstly, in the same way as the Netherlands, it has rights over the North Sea gas field, so it has its own supply of natural gas. Secondly, the same as the Netherlands, it's also geographically further away from Russia than a lot of the other European countries. But thirdly, and most importantly, Denmark is one of the most energy efficient countries in the world. There has been a huge focus on renewable energy in Denmark, and over 80% of all electricity produced in Denmark is now from renewable sources. 57% of all electricity comes from wind, 20% comes from biomass, and around 3% comes from solar. And alongside this high level of renewable energy, Denmark has also successfully introduced a district heating system for around two-thirds of the population of the country. And I'll just take a moment to explain what district heating is if you haven't heard the concept before. District heating systems rely upon the central production of heat and electricity, which is used to heat water. The heated water is then supplied directly to buildings and consumers, where it's used to heat rooms directly and also to generate domestic hot water. The domestic hot water gets heated in a heat exchanger, in which heated supply water transfers its heat directly to the water that is coming out of the taps in that property. Room heating is either used directly using the heated water that enters the property or also through a heat exchanger which can transfer heat directly to water within the building which is then pumped around the underfloor heating system. Once the heat is transferred out of the water, the cold water returns back to the heating plant where it is reheated and so the circulation goes on. So I wanted to mention this system because I think Denmark is in a really great position with regards to what's going on globally right now with the increase in fossil fuels caused by the situation in Ukraine. They've got themselves to a perfect position of having a high level of renewable energy and then utilising that energy to be able to feed it directly into all of the consumers' homes. And of course, the high levels of renewable energy will also be useful as we move towards more electric vehicles amongst the consumers. So overall, the direct impact on Denmark of the loss of gas from Russia is going to be quite limited. They didn't have a large dependence on gas anyway, but they've also got their own gas supplies and they're also a coastal nation, so they can take deliveries of liquefied natural gas very easily if they wanted to. 
In addition to cutting off the supplies to the Netherlands and Denmark, Gazprom has also announced that it has cut off the supply to Shell in Germany. Now, if you've been following the channel, you'll know that Shell was one of the first companies that came out and announced that it was exiting from all of its operations in Russia. It had some joint ventures that it had been working on for the last 20 years, and it was estimated that the financial hit would be around $5 billion to Shell. So it's no surprise that Shell have come out and stipulated that they will not be paying in rubles. Shell operates as an intermediary in Germany. It buys gas in from Russia and then sells that gas onwards in the German markets. So it's now been cut off completely. Now Shell was buying around 1.2 billion cubic meters of gas directly for Russia and selling it on. So it will now have to source that gas from alternative suppliers. So there will be a slight impact with regards to Shell's profits, but this is more of an issue for the German supplies really because it's included in the total network that's feeding around Germany. This graph shows the breakdown of Russia's exports of natural gas by country for 2021. So we can see that the largest single country exposure that Russia has is to Germany, where it's selling around 19% of all of its gas. The next largest individual exposure is to Turkey with 10.7%, then Italy with 10.4%, Belarus at 7.9% and France at 7%. The only country that Russia has cut the supply of natural gas to so far that shows on this chart is Poland, which previously was accounting for around 4% of all of its exports. And we can see that the rest of Europe accounts for around 22.5%. This table shows the percentage dependence for each individual country on Russian gas supplies. So this shows how much of the gas each of these countries is using as of 2020 that came from Russia. And if we look at the countries who have so far been cut off, we can see that Finland was getting 94% of its gas from Russia. However, gas represents a relatively small part of the energy market in Finland. So whilst the percentage is large, the impact on the country is relatively limited. Bulgaria, however, was getting 77% of all of its gas. And gas is important to Bulgaria. And what we've seen so far is that Greece has been assisting Bulgaria and it's been using the pipelines that are in place that were installed by Russia to actually feed gas the other way. So rather than it coming from Russia through Bulgaria and towards Greece, Greece is now feeding gas that's going backwards in that pipeline since the supply has been switched off by Russia. Poland was receiving around 40% of all of its gas directly from Russia, and it's surviving on all of this storage that it's built up. So we've got high levels of storage. Poland has been working on that. They've been making sure that they had sufficient supplies, and they're now running down their stocks with a view to finding alternative suppliers before we hit the winter period. The Netherlands had relatively small exposure to Russia and will easily be able to replace the supplies. But I think what's really interesting to note about this chart is that Germany and Italy still have huge exposure to Russian gas and they also are very dependent on gas for both electricity and heating and cooking for their households. And that's really been a main problem for the EU. They recently announced that they're switching off all oil purchases by the end of 2022 and gas will follow but they're really trying to work out how they can get the logistics to work for Germany and Italy because switching off gas is not quite as easy as switching off oil. There are existing systems to transport oil. However, the transport of gas is more difficult because it has to be converted from gas into a liquefied form. It then has to be transported and then you need to regasify. So you need to be able to turn the liquid back into a gas under controlled conditions and the installation of regasification plants is what's causing the delay with regards to banning the purchase of all Russian natural gas. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I think what we've seen over the last couple of days with the Netherlands and Denmark being switched off by Russia proves that Russia were not bluffing. President Putin was absolutely serious when he said that he would cut off the supply to any unfriendly nation that was not prepared to pay in rubles. And on the flip side of that, we've seen countries following through with their commitments to stop purchasing energy from Russia. 
So it looks like nobody in this game is bluffing and everybody is going to see through exactly what they said they were going to do. So that really means for Europe that we will see an orderly progression of all of the countries walking away from those Russian supplies. And that's going to have some major consequences for the global economy and for Russia. For the global economy, it means that we will definitely see higher gas prices over the course of the next 6 to 12 months, but probably permanently. We're probably going to see a complete change of the way the supply system is operated, and we're going to see countries moving away from receiving gas in a gas form and all moving towards liquefied natural gas. So that will require regasification plants to be constructed all across Europe. And the problem that you've got for a lot of different countries is that they're landlocked. So it's easy to set up a regasification system if you've got coastline because you can ship that liquefied natural gas in, you can then turn it back into gas and then feed it through your pipeline into all of your country. For the countries that are sitting in the middle of Europe, they are really reliant upon other countries either doing that at the coast and then selling that gas onto them, or they're going to have to transport the liquefied natural gas over land and then regasify it. And that's going to be incredibly expensive compared to what we've got right now. So overall, we'll see a big increase in gas prices, and that means that we're going to see an increase in a lot of prices. Because in Europe, a lot of countries are using gas to produce electricity. There's been widespread adoption of gas-fired power stations all across Europe because they produce less CO2 than the old-fashioned coal-fired power stations. So we've got a really high dependence on that electricity. So if the price of gas goes up, that means that the price of electricity will go up because it feeds straight through. And the price of electricity feeds into the price of everything. So we've talked about oil before and the price of oil going up, meaning that means transport costs go up and therefore that increases the price of everything. But when you've got an increase in the price of electricity, that increases the cost of living to all consumers because everybody needs electricity. And it also increases the production costs for a lot of companies that use electricity in their manufacturing processes. So overall, this is bad news for the global economy because we're going to see the price of everything increasing. And it's really bad news for the global economy in 2022 because we've already got extremely high levels of inflation all across Europe and all across the world. And increased gas prices, increased electricity prices is going to push that even higher. So that means that we'll have a lower standard of living and we'll have less disposable income in a lot of countries, which is going to mean a contraction in the economy. But also when we've got rising inflation, we're going to see interest rates being pushed up to try to bring inflation back down. And higher interest rates means a higher cost of borrowing for anybody that's got debt that's linked to a floating rate. So that means that all consumers and companies will have less disposable income and therefore they'll spend less and that leads to a further contraction in the economy. So we're heading potentially for the nightmare scenario of high inflation and either falling or stagnant economy. So what's been coined stagflation in the past. But overall, we can call it a recession. And the chances of a recession kicking in in Europe and the rest of the world later in 2022 or early in 2023 is increasing by the day. Every single time one of these countries gets switched off, that means that there is higher demand for liquefied natural gas and that's pushing the prices up and that's therefore feeding through into inflation. So it's inevitable, I think, that we're going to have really high rates of inflation for the rest of this year and on into 2023. And that is likely to cause a global recession. Now, in terms of what the impact of all of these movements are to Russia, the fact that all the countries in Europe are now lining up and waiting to be switched off means that Russia is going to have to find new markets. And as I showed you earlier in this video, currently Russia sells more than 80% of all of its gas directly to Europe. And it's doing that in a very cost efficient way because it's got the pipelines in place it's now going to have to move to selling that gas into Asia. 
Now, in theory, it might be able to set up pipelines to supply gas to China. However, China is a very big country and those pipelines would need to be extremely long. So that's a massive amount of capital infrastructure that Russia would need to put in place. And the problem that they have right now is that they're defaulting on their international debt. So it's unlikely that they'll be able to raise bond finance to be able to pay for that. So they'll need to find the money from somewhere else. They may be able to ask the Chinese to help, but that's a big question mark. So the most likely option for Russia is that it will need to liquefy its gas and then move it on tankers all around the world. And that comes back to the problem that I've mentioned previously about not having enough tanker capacity in the world to be able to cope with that huge increase in volume of liquefied natural gas. And let's not forget, this will be at exactly the same time as Europe is looking to buy massive volumes of liquefied natural gas from the rest of the world. So those tankers are already going to be full of gas that's going into Europe. So there's a big question mark as to whether or not Russia will be able to find enough tankers. And then we've got the other question as to whether or not they can get any insurance for those tankers because the Western world provides most of the shipping insurance and without that insurance, those tankers will not be able to set sail. So there's a number of big questions here, but in the short term, it's going to be a big problem for Russia because they don't have the volume of liquefied natural gas facilities to be able to switch 80% of its current supply of gas into LNG. That's going to be a major issue. So as soon as we see the bigger countries in Europe switching off their supplies, as soon as we see Germany and Italy cutting ties, there will be a huge fall in the amount of sales that Russia is achieving because they won't be able to replace it instantly with LNG sales to Asia. And then finally, there's the other question here as to whether or not Europe and America will be able to put secondary sanctions into place. If they can persuade India and China that it's against their interest to do further business with Russia, then that means that Russia will have limited markets to sell into and therefore it will have a huge fall in revenues. So there's a number of really big risks to Russia here as we're seeing this supply chain shifting and Europe is pivoting away from Russian gas and more towards the rest of the world. Russia needs to find new markets and it's going to be very challenging both logistically and also from a political perspective. So overall, these movements are going to have a very negative impact on the global economy, but potentially could have a disastrous impact on the Russian economy, particularly during 2022 and 2023. As we see more of the countries moving away from these purchases, Russia is going to struggle to find instant replacements. So I'll keep you posted as soon as there's any news of any other countries being switched off by Russia or anything else that's relevant. If you've liked what I've said today and found it useful, informative and educational, please give me that thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. Hey guys, just a very quick update on Joe Blogs 2. I'm still waiting for some really good quality videos. So if you're thinking of making one or maybe you're halfway through it, get focused, get going, get doing it, do some editing, make sure it's nice and professional and you're very happy with it. Contact me and then we'll work out the details as to how to get that video up on the channel. So thanks for watching this particular part of the video and for watching this whole video all the way through to the end.